This video world, I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali and you are watching Fault Lines. The diplomatic situation between Pakistan and Afghanistan has not improved. Both the countries have tried their best to engage through diplomatic means but unfortunately have not been able to get some results. As an outcome of which, Pakistan is still facing terror attacks one after another. Let us go uh, back to the year 2023 and give you a quick a statistical recall of the data that counts that there were uh, more than 641 militant attacks in this one calendar year, causing life losses of 974 people out of which 265 were the Jawans and officers of law enforcement agencies that embraced Shahadat. There were 1,351 people injured and despite all the diplomatic efforts made by the government of Pakistan, still the anti-Pakistan elements within Afghanistan are operating with all the freedom. How is this going to affect the relationship between the two countries at large and what other options does Pakistan have as apparently the diplomatic option is not looking like uh, giving uh, the results that Pakistan is expecting at the moment. Uh, to talk about this very pertinent subject, uh, we have today invited uh, Major General Retired Inamul Haq Sahab. He's an expert of international relations. He is an po expert of political sociology and frequently writes in Express Tribune on Afghan affairs. Uh, Major General Retired Inamul Haq Sahab, I welcome you to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, please help us to understand the background of the relationship between the two countries ever since uh, Taliban have taken over. Pakistan had a lot of expectations, but things are not supposedly or apparently going in the right direction. Yes, uh, thank you, Shabazz. Uh, it's a very important uh, bilateral relationship uh, that Pakistan has with Afghanistan. And I have been uh, one of those people who welcome their takeover of Kabul in 2021. But uh, at that time, I, I also cautioned that we should not be overly optimistic about uh, them helping us vis-a-vis -vis TTP uh, in a significant way and that somehow the other had proved right. Uh, how do we uh, see the situation now? How should we see the situation now? And where should we go from here? Uh, you have seen that uh, I think for the first time, Pakistan launched uh, acknowledged airstrikes on 18th of uh, March equal to the 16th uh, March attack uh, on the Pakistani security forces, which resulted in the loss of lives of two officers of the Pakistan army, including a lieutenant colonel. So uh, if you look at the situation now, uh, the first is that Pakistan launched an airstrike, which was announced. And I think as far as the military leadership is concerned, I can say this with a lot of confidence that the government of Pakistan this time around means business with Afghanistan. And uh, we have uh, exhausted all political diplomatic means uh, to somehow the other uh, instill the sense of uh, proportion inside the uh, political dispensation in Afghanistan. That yes, you cannot evict the TTP from your soil for very cogent reasons, but the least you can do is to restrain them from launching their murderous attacks against Pakistan. And so far, it seems that they are somehow the other not delivering at this also. I've been saying this consistently, that there is a political division within the uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan over the TTP issue. Uh, the southern uh, the ideologues, uh, the Kandahari group, vis-a-vis -vis the hostile, the pragmatic group in the north, there is a division about the handling of the TTP. Uh, and I've been saying this thing, that TTP in the long run would be like a bone stuck in the neck of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. They won't be able to ugle it out, and they won't be able to take it down. But uh, as of now, uh, it has somehow the other uh, took, took both countries to a point where this, the relationship between the two sides is close to rupture. And if I may also say uh, that uh, the political, the strategic dividend that we were expecting after the ascension of IEA to power in Kabul, that uh, strategic uh, dividend as of now stands temporarily suspended. So we can uh, see a lot of options. Pakistan still has not uh, exhausted the complete options. We have a lot of options with the Afghanistan, and I would discuss them if you have questions about that. In my next question, what other options uh, are we left with? Because 
the use of force or coercion might not be the best option to deal with uh, such uh, such problems uh, in your immediate neighborhood. Uh, both the countries are called cousin nations. We have a lot of common factors together. 70% of trade that Afghanistan is making is through Pakistan, even if it's going back to India. So how the two countries are, uh, what other options do, do the two countries have to overcome the problem that they are facing at the moment? You see, uh, Shambhad, you've got to do what you've got to do. You've got to do without making a lot of noise. Uh, this has been a consistent theme that I've been saying around. Uh, the military option is very much part of a new strategic construct that Pakistan has. Uh, Within the Afghanistan, we have immense leverages, and I would just uh, enumerate some of them. KP and Balochistan is home to, at this point in time, also over 1.3 million Afghan refugees. Out of these, 0.6 million are those refugees who came to Pakistan after the takeover, Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. And out of this figure, a whooping and worrisome 0.7 million are those people who are unwilling to register uh, in the system uh, in, in Pakistan. So that is one. Uh, there are very much legal repatriation is Pakistan's option, and Pakistan can excite that option because Pakistan, contrary to popular perception in Afghanistan, is not signatory to any protocol on refugees. That is the 1956 Geneva Convention on Refugees and its 1967 protocol. The, with the, the Afghan refugees, the only agreement that Afghanistan has signed is with the UNHCR in 2003, where uh, the principle of voluntarism and gradualism was approved between Pakistan, UNHCR, and Afghanistan to repatriate the uh, Afghan refugees. Uh, this agreement was then subsequently extended to Iran, which was included in this agreement in 12, 12, 12, uh, 2012. And uh, at that time, it was decided by the UNHCR and the international community that the host country would be provided significant help and the, ref the refugees would be repatriated with dignity and honor and they would be sustainably incorporated in the fabric of Afghan life, which has not happened. It is not Pakistan's fault. As far as the uh, Afghan reliance on Pakistan is concerned, it's multifarious. If you go to the hospital in KP and Balochistan, they are full of one patients on a daily basis. Our universities and Peshawar, Quetta, and elsewhere are full of the uh, one student, particularly the female students, who cannot find enough education opportunity inside Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan is not, uh, Afghanistan is not Iran, and Pakistan is not uh, sort of, so to say, uh, NATO forces, or it is not the ex, the former USSR. Uh, there is an argument going inside the Pakistani uh, Afghan circles who say that uh, militarily uh, we should be sort of, so to say, on a weaker wicket with the Afghanistan. I don't subscribe to that notion. The USSR failed and the American forces, the NATO forces, 14 other countries failed because they were inside the Afghan territory. Pakistan has no interest inside the Afghan territory as far as boots on the ground is concerned. Our interest is with the enclave, the TTP enclave on the eastern part of Afghanistan, and uh, that uh, probably uh, Pakistan will, uh, is, all, is, is all within its rights to take any action that it deems fit, whether we that is because Pakistan has, uh, has all exhausted political options and Pakistan has exhausted all other uh, diplomatic options in this. We also need to remember that uh, sometimes uh, with the Afghanistan, uh, tough talk uh, yields and tough talk has. Uh, uh, a, a premium. I will just take you to history. In 1960-61, there was Bajor operation, where the Afghan Royal Army, then the Afghan Royal Army, had captured some strategic points inside Pakistani Bajor. And uh, at that time, uh, the government of Pakistan launched the airstrikes on the Afghan Army inside Afghanistan in Punal province, which imposed a retreat on the Afghan Army. So when you have to uh, protect your strategic interest, I think uh, you are all within your means to go and do what you need to do without making a lot of noise. Uh, in terms of taking option, advantage of your uh, presence in the show, I would also want to understand why TTA would be throwing all of their options out to support TTP. There can be logically two reasons. One is perhaps some ideological harmony between the two sides, or perhaps they are trying to use it as a leverage bargain chip to negotiate better terms with Pakistan because Pakistan has 
taken certain steps that, uh, th that, that TTA might believe are going against them, like a crackdown on smuggling and also the repatriation that you were just talking about. So what do you think can be primarily the reason behind TTA's all-out support for TTP? Shabad, uh, I've been saying this consistently, uh, that uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, I don't call it uh, TTA, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a functioning government at this point in time. Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is divided on the TTP issue, and understandably so. They were the bachelor in jihad, and there is a sizable uh, influential group within the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan who just do not want to partner with them. And that is understandable. They were bachelors in jihad. Uh, they are somehow the other, they are uh, under Islamic fraternity. It is, they think, un Islamic to sort of evict them from the Afghan soil at this point in time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the two visible ideological camps within the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan are the Sadarnar Kandahari groups, which are more puritanical, and they are more aligned with the TTP ideologically. And the northern host war group, the Haqqanis per se, they are pragmatists and they understand Pakistan's predicament, I think, a little more clearly than the Kandahar sees it. So this is a division within the uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan over the TTP issue. At this point in time, the existential issue for the Islamic Emirate of uh, Afghanistan is to show a modicum of solidarity and unity outside. The Kandaharis are the more and the shakers of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, and somehow the other in decision making they prevail. And there is a compulsion for them to show a solid face outside. That is why even if there are the differences on the TTP issue and a host of other issues, they would like to show a, a united face to the rest of the world, especially towards Pakistan. So that is the division and that is the implication. However, having said that, uh, I've been also saying consistently that uh, if you give time to the TTP issue, this issue will die its own death. Uh, but... With, within that also, the standard advice and the standard course of action for the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan would be if they cannot evict them, which understandably they cannot, they are either unwilling or not capable or both to take them out of Afghanistan. Well, we understand that. But the only thing they can do is that they can restrain them from launching murderous attacks against Pakistan and take them away from the border areas and shift them towards deeper inside Afghanistan. I was in a, on a dinner last night with a lot of uh, knowledgeable people, and my hunch is that perhaps the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is now thinking seriously on these lines. Negotiations have failed. 2022 negotiations were botched attempt at restoring a sort of a peace with the, with the TDP. It has failed. It will fail again because the government needs to talk to them from a position of strength when the time is right. I say when the time is right. Time is not right now. So there are ideological divisions within Afghanistan. They have political, diplomatic, and domestic compulsions for not taking a robust action against the TTP. But the least they can do is to appease the ideological camp which is lined with the TTP vis-a-vis uh, the TTP attacks on Pakistan. They can, if they cannot, if they can restrain them. But the least, probably the Pakistan is asking at this point in time. Yes, Shama. Thank you very much, uh, General Retired and Amal Huck, for being guests in our show. Ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, our first guest in the show who uh, has uh, given us a deep dive into the issue itself and pointed out that TTA uh, not only doesn't have capacity to take a hands on collusion with TTP, but also has ideological alignment with them. Moving forward to the next topic of our show is the Basham attack. Uh, uh, on 26th of uh, March, uh, attack took place uh, through a suicide vehicle. On another vehicle uh, that carried five Chinese national and one Pakistani national. Uh, all five Pakistan, uh, Chinese national and uh, one Pakistani national lost their life in this incident. Uh, within March, there had been two more attacks, one in Gawadar and one in another naval uh, coastline, uh, somewhere near the coastline of Balochistan. Uh, attacks on Chinese interest, on Chinese assets, on Chinese personnel, on Chinese uh, infrastructure uh, have been quite rampant. Uh, let me remind you that back in April 2022, uh, a Chinese uh, 
bus where three teachers were uh, sitting, three Chinese uh, teachers were sitting, was also targeted by a lady suicide bomber. Not the first time, but uh, all of this happening at a time when uh, China and Pakistan's economic interest is going together in form of uh, CPAC, which is one of the landmark initiatives of the recent times, is very alarming. To talk about this very pertinent subject, we have uh, invited uh, on Skype uh, with us Mia Abrar Hussain. Mia Abrar is head of news of Daily Pakistan today. He has a special focus on counter terrorism and interstate relationship in Asia. Uh, Mia Abrar, I welcome you to the show. Uh, Abrar, if you can unmute your uh, mic, I, I would be able to listen to you. Yeah, uh, can you uh, Abrar, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Abrar, tell us about uh, this Basham attack and why it is such an important development that the president, the interior minister, the foreign minister had to walk to the Chinese embassy and to offer the best they could uh, in, in order to uh, investigate the bad doers. Thank you, Shabbat. Thank you very much for having me. Actually, uh, we have to uh, look at this attack uh, in a cohesive manner. You know, uh, we, we know that this is second uh, successive attack in Skardu, or sorry, Kohistan, uh, which is a volatile area. We know that Dasu uh, project was also attacked in 2021. And uh, there were 13 casualties in that attack as uh, well. Abrar, if I can stop you here, I, I just can't see your face completely. You'll have to, you know, change your seat adjustment a bit. Yeah, that's fine now. Okay, so you were telling me that this is the second attack uh, on the Dasu project scene. Yeah, and uh, uh, we know that 13 uh, precious lives also went there uh, in 2021. Though the mastermind of that attack was uh, killed in Kunar you know, Afghanistan in 2023. But we know that uh, the agencies had to track down the, uh, you know, uh, Kunar attack mastermind for two long years. So this is tragic because this is tragic because this is all happening in Pakistan. Pakistan is ironclad friend of China. China and Pakistan have a history of, mil, uh, you know, decades uh, together. Uh, they have developed together. They have... Uh, you know, seen the fruit of development as well. So it is unfortunate, but we have to zoom out of this attack for, the, for, for a while and we should see th what's happening in the region. You know, why only Chinese are being attacked in Pakistan? Why they are not being attacked in Africa where they have the, you know, uh, biggest presence uh, in, in terms of uh, development, infrastructure development, or in, even they have a military, you know, a naval base there in Djibouti. So they, they are, you know, BRI is almost in 145 countries in across the world, including Europe, including Russia. But why it is only Pakistan being targeted? I, I think that uh, the authorities of Pakistan, China and Afghanistan, they need to evolve a joint trilateral mechanism to provide security to you know, Chinese projects in Pakistan, and all, but, but but the question is why Chinese are not being targeted in Afghanistan? Why only in Pakistan? This is a huge question, I think, and uh, your viewers uh, and uh, uh, I think the all concerned quarters need to ponder upon. The Chinese side have been requested to help in uh, the investigation of of uh, this attack. Do you think this is going to help? Yes, a uh, Chinese team has arrived two days back uh, and they are uh, coordinating with Pakistani authorities here, law enforcers and also Mohsin Nakhvi, our you know, uh, interior minister, he also paid them a visit and they had a detailed discussion. They would do their work, I, I know that. But I, actually what I wanted to say is that this is a bigger issue and we have to look at in a cohesive uh, manner. We have to view the full picture, actually. This is not about only terrorism. There are political, uh, you know, motives behind this. We know that, you know, Pakistan has been, a, uh, you know, a target uh, of terrorism for, for long. But 
why why only Chinese are being targeted in Pakistan? Yes, we know that there have been so many terrorist attacks on Pakistan's security agencies. We know that uh, development is the target of terrorists. But why? This is a huge question mark, you know. Uh, and we know we need to know why ISK is not only targeting Pakistan, but also Russia, but also Iran, but also Afghanistan. So I think that terrorism is something, a phenomena being used to deter development in the entire region we are living in. You know, uh, while Afghanistan has uh, stabilized a lot uh, uh, in, in the past two years or so, but why, why only, you know, ISK is a, a ferocious organization which is hitting targets in these countries? why this entire region is being kept volatile, why no stability is allowed to come in this, this entire region. I think that this is the question we need to ponder on. Ibrahim, I would want to ask you more questions if you can give me a bit of more headroom because I still cannot see your face completely. My next question would be, uh, remind us of the significance of Pakistan's economic relationship with China at this very particular moment when we are in the middle of not only this CPAC project as well, but Pakistan is also facing an economic turmoil in which during the last two years, China has been extremely generous and extremely helpful. Yes, uh, China has been helpful. You know, when China came into Pakistan in 2013, Pakistan was bleeding economically. Pakistan had long hours of load shedding, you know, at least 22 hours load shedding on a daily basis. Even Pakistani's industry was going out and not only going out, but Pakistani industrialists was, we were even going to Bangladesh, we were even going to Dubai, we were even going to India. And they were even going to so, so much so that uh, in, a, in an enemy country they were investing. And at that time, when even Pakistani was not interested to invest in Pakistan, China came. China came and they invested in Pakistan. Now the load shedding hours are gone. Pakistan is, in in past uh, four years, Pakistani exports have touched very high. Uh, you know, historic achievements have been made. Uh, though we, we are bleeding economically as, uh, still, but still, you know, China has been the biggest support Pakistan has ever had. So that's why my question, why Pakistan is being targeted, we know we need to know the political reasons. They are not, they, 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 this is not only religious fanatics who are targeting it. You know, there are nationalists, they are also targeting uh, Chinese. So actually, this is, I fear that there are evil forces behind this sinister plan. They don't want Pakistan and the entire region to progress. This is not about China. We need to know this. China is in, in uh, you know, developing infrastructure projects in entire world. They are not being targeted there. Only they are being targeted in Pakistan. They are not even being targeted in Afghanistan. So we need to know the real reasons. We need to know our real... Abrar, Abrar you called it evil forces. The foreign officers' uh, rhetoric was also very well crafted, very well articulated. No one has named anyone as yet, and I am also of the view that nobody should be named unless uh, the entire investigation is done. But if the nexus of evil after this detailed investigation in which Chinese are helping us is found in the east of Pakistan, will this jeopardize or will this affect, will this dent the relationship, the economic relationship that China is having with their eastern neighbor any further? Okay, let me explain. You know, BRI was launched in 2012, in uh, October 2012 by President Xi Jinping. And BRI's, uh, you know, pilot project was declared CPAC. Now, CPAC's first phase has been completed successfully in Pakistan, despite all the, uh, you know, uh, you know, target, uh, targeted attacks against, you know, uh, Chinese uh, installations, uh, despite all the economic, uh, you know, bleeding in Pakistan, despite the ferocious environment here, first phase we success, successfully completed. And the credit goes to 
Pakistani and Chinese governments who did a great job. Now we are entering the second phase. Now second phase is very crucial because this provides the first rail link between, you know, starting from, uh, that is, the project is called ML1. And this starts from, you know, uh, Peshawar to Karachi. Once the rail link is completed, then stability is coming also in Afghanistan. So Pakistan is going to develop its rail links to uh, Afghanistan and Iran. And if this happens, you know, China would have its first rail link with, with the Central Asian states as well. There has been so many projects being go, going on other than CPAC phase two. We know that Pakistan is establishing its route with Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan. We are going to uh, open a new uh, era of development, trade, the connectivity, the connectivity the world is looking for. Now the problem is that Pakistan's uh, route through Afghanistan is the shortest possible route uh, with the uh, Central Asian states. Some forces don't want this to happen. So that's why I, I have, uh, uh, you know, blame game is no, no, no solution. So I, what I'm saying is that if stability comes to this region, this region is going to be the corridor of the world. The world is going to come and invest in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and the Central Asia. Now, Central Asia, you know, uh, is a resource-rich uh, region. Then Pakistan and Afghanistan also untapped resources are here. So that's why I, when I say is that one needs to zoom out of this attack and and uh, view uh, uh, and uh, the holistic picture. Then thank you, thank you very much, Abrar Hussain, for this uh, excellent uh, take on, uh, on on the current relationship between Pakistan and China. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll take a break and we'll join you back with last segment of the program. Stay with us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about the issue of women rights, it is not only an issue that countries like Pakistan, India and Bangladesh are facing. Almost all the countries in the world, to in some shape and form, to some extent, are facing this problem. This problem is so grave in nature that according to United Nations, one out of three women have experienced either physical or sexually intimated other types of violences, be it workplace, be it academic institutes, be it families, this phenomena is taking place over and over. Time and again, we come across such news, such incidences that remind us that the state of woman right is in peril, not only in Pakistan, but in many other countries. But for Pakistan, the issues are more complex in nature. As we have said in the programs earlier, there are some uh, issues embedded in the very fabric of the society uh, that exacerbates the challenges for Pakistan. To talk about this very pertinent uh, and key subject, I have invited uh, Mr. Ruj Azm Khan, who is an expert of the subject and is my guest in the studio. Ruj, I welcome you to the show. Thank you so much. First things first, so how do you think Pakistan sets into the international equation with regards to the women's rights and what are our concerns? as Pakistanis with regards to the women's rights? Okay, according to me, the most concerning aspects of women's rights in Pakistan is because of the pervasive culture of gender violence and discrimination. If you look at the uh, 
if you look at Pakistan, we will see that mm, all girls and women across the country are facing significant problems ranging from honor killing, domestic violence, forced marriages and which limits to early marriages and also if we have, we do, they do not have good health care. It is because of the prevalent domestic uh, we, which we have embedded in our society and that is because of patriarchal norms. And you talk about these early marriages to be one of the major problems. Uh, why are you concerned as uh, an expert on social affairs for early marriages to be a problem for Pakistan? Uh, when I was searching for this early marriages and the percentage of it, it was so shocking for me and it will also shock you. The For example, if there are the percentage of girls who are 18, it is 18.3 percentage. And those who are 15 years, their percentage is 6.3. This is, this is ruining the lives of count, countless girls and if we look at they are not just like early marriages not only snatch their childhood but it also exposes them to many health issues such, such as child abortion and many such things like that. So Did I will just say that 18 percent of girls are getting married at the age of uh, 18 and another 15 percent are 18.3 uh, at the age of 18 and 3.6 at the age of 15. 15 so that becomes mother of many other problems that the girls are. So do you think that uh, going forward this is giving birth to many other problems like uh, lack of education, lack of economic opportunities for, for like, these girls? Yes, I would agree with it because if early marriages both of them are not earning. So how will they manage to have their life? How will they manage to give a good lifestyle to their kids? So definitely it perpetuates poverty. We have a national commission on the status of women. Ideally, this should be the institution looking into these matters. Uh, how do you see the performance of National Commission? Uh, National Commission has a crucial mandate to safeguard and protect the rights of women and it has done wonderful things. For example, it has uh, it advises the government on legislation and policies that are related to uh, that are related to women and it has accomplished some goal as well like for example it has done some awareness campaigns and it also do research which 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 also tells us about that how much gender disparity our society is facing and it also tells the society that there is gender discrimination and it also aware the women about their rights and it also legally protect the women. Uh, Uruj, honor killing is uh, another problem that primarily sits in the rural settings of some areas of Pakistan. This phenomena has been on the rise in the past as well. Can you apprise us on the state of honor killing in Pakistan? Yes, of course. First of all, I want to ask the whole society why the honor has been c connected to a woman. Like I also want to ask you why the honor is connected to only a woman. If you are doing the same thing, it's fine. But if I am doing the same thing, somebody will kill me in the name of honor. Now coming towards your question, honor killing is something that some that a girl is killed by her family members and the family members think that the girl has committed something wrong which, which invites shame and dishonor. But killing is not honor. We should understand this fact that killing is not honor. And this, like, for example, if a girl is killed, it is because if she chooses a spouse of her choice, if she is in a relationship that the society does not approve of. However, there are legislature, uh, legislative reforms to end killings like this, but still we do not see any improvement. Harassment at workplace is uh, another form of this violence that is taking place both against men and women, but I believe women are becoming more subject to it. Do you have some stats about it or do you have uh, something new about the subject? Well, when it comes to harassment at workplace, for example, there is a very basic example. If you look at our politicians, Maryam Nawaz is being, uh, like her character is being assassinated. We know that she is a very good, renowned politician, but all other main politicians, they, their character is not assassinated, If even if the, their characters are assassinated. So it's normal for our society. But if a woman is a politician, she is a media person or she is in work, she faces not only verbal abuse, abuses, but sometimes physical abuses and sometimes also such derogatory remarks that a woman cannot tolerate. So going forward, uh, what do you think would be the main concern for Pakistan to overcome these issues as Pakistan has just a new government in place um, and all of these problems that you have highlighted should be on the watch list of, of this government as well? 
Yes, of course, government should look at these problems, but I believe that we need to work not only on governmental level, but the whole society should work. We should educate every person in this regard that a woman is also a human being and she deserves to be educated. She deserves to be uh, she deserves to be married a person of her choice and she and she is supposed to work. So, I believe that government should make stringent action in this regard and make policies that protects women. Thank you very much, Uruj, for being guest in our show. Ladies and gentlemen, the state of women rights remain in peril, not only in Pakistan, but also in many other countries. This is now up to this government. How does it take this bull by the horns? We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz.